This is uh, Revelation Lesson 40, uh, presented on March 19, 2023. Father, we thank you for being with us once again to keep our minds and our hearts open to you. And we just ask that you help us with this difficult portion of your word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is uh, this is one of my favorite things is a timeline to help us determine where we are in the study of in Galatians. I don't really have a way to indicate things on uh, this this video, but let me just try to describe it as best I can. It's labeled at the top, Last Days. And what that means is that the left-hand side of the timeline Again, the, the abomination of desolation. That's when the Antichrist declares who he is, goes into the temple, declares that he is God, demands worship as God, and will kill those who do not worship him. And it will end up uh, out at the beginning of the... Uh, Millennium. There is a period of time when the end of the 70th week prophesied by Daniel will appear, and it's labeled there. It's the end of the 70th week. And is hallmarked particularly by the killing by the Antichrist of the two witnesses. We are working out beyond that. And the prophecy of Daniel indicate to us that beyond the end of the 70th week, there are two additional periods of 30 days. One I have labeled uh, uh, the destruction section, and I will describe what goes on in the destruction sections. 30 days after that, then they begin another 30-day period and it, I will have it labeled the restoration period. At the end of the restoration period will be the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. Now, with that, and uh, if you want to stop it or print this and look at it carefully, the references to these these items in the timeline are on the slide. Um, so we will now uh, go on from there, but we're working out in the two 30-day prolongations of the 70th week of the Daniel. So, in the destructive period, there are the bold judgments, the seven bold judgments, which are highly destructive. And when they are completed, it is said that the wrath of God is complete. There will be new heavens and a new earth. Now, the old heavens and earth have not been annihilated, but they have been renovated. And uh, 
they are renovated and cleansed and the surface of the earth in the process is substantially changed so that for example the uh, the present uh, temple mount is flattened and uh, the land is generally flattened now we will go on from there and then we'll begin the restoration period there is the restoration of the new and you see the word kinos is not neos like it was just freshly made but it is kinos it is the time has come that it be refurbished replenished redone and we will see then also in the restoration period the completion of the new heavens and the new earth renovated cleansed but not annihilated and the surface of the earth in the process is substantially changed from its appearance at the end of the destructive period. Now, let's talk about the millennial condition. Israel, during that time, at the end of the Restoration, Israel will be preeminent among the nations and it is also restored to the full size promised to Israel by God. There is a new temple and that temple is built by Christ with his own hands. It's a new temple and has a new form of worship. The sacramental system is reintroduced and much to the consternation and chagrin of many people who study this. And the sacrificial system is restored from what we observed in the Old Testament. Now remember, the land is restored but also changed. The literal temple, the millennial temple, so-called, and we sometimes call that the Ezekiel's temple. It's a literal temple with literal but different sacrifices. And this temple, as I said, is built by Christ himself. Here's a drawer, uh, an artistic drawing of the temple. It's very complicated and we're not going to go into that at this time. It is taken up during the last eight chapters or chapters one through eight of the book of Ezekiel. Why it's placed there, I am not but it's a fairly complicated arrangement and quite different from any of the previous temples I'll mention some of the ways in which it is different this slide is the portion of the earth's surface after the restoration period. Now, if you'll remember, we talked about when Jesus returned to earth and the Jews that we were there, um, the 144,000 plus people, 
recognized him as the Messiah, and all of them were led by him to the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was split into north and south so that a large valley was produced, and it is highly probable that Jesus led this group of people who were following him into that valley so that they were underground and in comfort while the intense destruction that is going on on the surface of the earth. So they were underground. Well, we kind of left it where what happened to them after all of that and what, where were they and what were they doing when they came out of Azel, the big valley? Well, this is a map. It is a artist restoration of the accounts of the surface of the earth drawn from Ezekiel's chapter. 47 and 48. And if you will notice now, there is a sea. The sea, uh, <clears throat> Mediterranean, and along the coastline and in the area of the former Israel, which has now been restored to its full size, and along the shoreline. There are allocations of land to the tribes of Israel. As a side curiosity, we notice that when they were, the, the 144,000 were sealed, uh, Dan was omitted. Well, Dan is here. He's up to the north, as he was originally. And if you notice, there is a, a round circle. And that is the site of the Temple Mount, which has now been restored to its full height. And the Temple that is newly made is corresponding in it, it's almost touching the mount of the temple and it is in very close proximity and in fact we'll see in other uh, other on other occasions that the new Jerusalem has descended upon the earth, but not touching it, but just, just there, so that the presence of the new temple, which is in the new Jerusalem, is almost sitting on the original site of the Temple Mount. It's a very complicated uh, situation. And in that day, this is from Joel, in that day, that is after the day of the Lord, the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of the Lord to water the valley of Siddim. Now, that's one of the, the several differences in that millennial temple versus any of the previous books. In Zechariah, one of the late 
prophet. Um, it says, I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city will be captured, the houses plundered, the women ravished, half of the city exiled. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. Now, goes on Zechariah chapter, uh, verse 24. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives which is in the front of Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in its middle from east to west by a very large valley so that half of the mountain will move itself toward the north and the other half toward the south. South. And many people will come and say, Come. Now, this is after all this restoration. Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, Isaiah says, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his path. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, again from Isaiah. The glory of the Lord from Isaiah, from this time from chapter 60, the glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, and the cypress together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. And I shall make the place of my feet glorious. Haggai, one of the minor prophets, chapter 2. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. He's talking now about the Solomonic temple but in comparison to the temple after the restoration. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is a millennial temple. Well, it's a literal temple, literal, though different sacrifices. It has a detailed description of architecture in the latter part of Ezekiel. It's unlike any previous temple. It's too big, and a river flows out from it, which is not true of any of the former temples. Isaiah, again, in 50, Isaiah 56 says, Even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer. For all the people. And Isaiah in chapter 6 he says, All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together to you. The rams of Nebioth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar. 
and I shall glorify my glorious power. For thus says the Lord, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. Now, that's not true for a long time. Uh, after the, with the uh, Babylonian captivity, members from the house of David sitting on the throne did not exist, and the kingdoms of Israel were replaced by the Gentiles until the fullness of the Gentiles came. The Levitical priest shall never lack a man before me to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to repair the sacrifices continually. That comes from Jeremiah. The glory of the God of the Lord will return through the eastern gates and fill the temple. This comes from Ezekiel chapter 43, with Ezekiel 8 through 12 chapters. When the glory of the Lord left the temple by the eastern gate, and my addition there is it has not yet returned. When the Romans destroyed the temple in 20 AD, they went into the Holy of Holies that normally would have resulted in death. But when they went in there, all they found was a boulder, a big rock. There was no Ark of the Covenant, nobody in there, just a rock. Why is this temple specifically millennial and not eternal? First, it's near the Great Sea, from Ezekiel 47. There is no sea in the new Jerusalem, in the new earth. This is from Revelation 21. There is no temple in the new Jerusalem. See, Revelation 21. In Zadokian priesthood, Zadok was a priest. In the line of a perpetual priesthood, beginning with Aaron, then Phineas, then Zadok. This is all from 1 Samuel 2. This links the Zadokian line to the royal line of David. There's no Ark of the Covenant in this temple. There's no table of the law. There is no cherubim, or no mercy seat, no veil, no menorah, or table of showbread. There will be a prince, but not a king, nor a high priest. There will be no day of atonement, no Pentecost, and no daily evening sacrifices. All this different from previous temple. Now Satan is released. Near the end of the millennium, he was bound for a thousand years. He raises a rebellion, the rebellion of Gog and Magog, a second battle of Gog and Magog followed by the death of the religious rebellious people, they will be consumed. 
and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the, the former corner, four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city of Jerusalem. And fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. That is the second death, where the beasts of the false prophet are also, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and who, him who sat upon it, and we know that that is Christ, not God the Father. And him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. This is the time of the restoration or the, of the new heavens and the new earth. And I saw the dead, the great, and the small. Standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. Yes, and Hades gave up the dead in them. Now remember, paradise is empty, part of Hades. And paradise is empty because Jesus, when he went there to meet the thief on the cross, he gathered all of those Old Testament saints that were in paradise or of Abraham's bosom and sent them to heaven. They were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. And death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. There are two deaths. There is physical death and spiritual death. And the spiritual death is forever. The other death is for life eternal. But the second death is the lake of fire, or what we call hell. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. When a thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. And will come out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. To gather them together for a war, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. They came up on the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. Fire came down from heaven and devoured them, devoured them. Now I'm going to stop here. There is a great white throne. Him who sat upon it, Jesus, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found. For them. It is a common statement that the people who appear.
appear before the great white throne are those evil people, unbelievers, resurrected from the death to be judged. I think that's partly true. But we will talk about that some more when we talk more about the thousand-year reign of Christ in the millennium. We'll stop for right now. Father, thank you for being with us again. This is scary and complicated, and we thank you for it helping us to open our hearts and our minds. Go with us, Father. Listen to our petitions, and if they are worthy, grant them. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.